What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we've got on a long-awaited special guest, and this is Andrew Henderson from Nomad Capitalist. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, good to be with you, man. Awesome. So I've done a super brief intro there, Andrew, but for people who don't know you and aren't familiar with your work, please tell them a little bit about you. Well, I am the Nomad Capitalist. We've been writing and talking about this idea of go where you're treated best for about a decade now. It was a conversation topic in my household growing up. I was very fortunate in that regard from age 12 uh, to be told, listen, the United States where I'm from may not always be the best place to live, to do business. I think that's certainly come true. Uh, and so I'm here to help people find places to find uh, more freedom, be able to keep more of their wealth, have a better lifestyle. And that could be everything from lower tax rates to you know taking back your personal freedom, better relationships, better weather, uh, but primarily lower taxes, more personal freedom, fewer regulations on investment, better investment returns. I think that nobody's country is number one in any of those probably let alone all of them. And that's what we talk about. I hear that. I'm curious to know a little bit more about your background. How is it that in your family, you said these are conversations that you've been having for a long time. I know that your dad sometimes does videos on your channel, sharing things from his perspective. So he's obviously got a much more global and open-minded perspective, I think, than certainly than, than the average American. Um, I know that I'm from the UK originally, but I know people everywhere, but people in the U.S. in particular tend to be very, very U.S. centric and not really see and consider things beyond that. And so what is it um, in the way that you grew up in your background that put all this stuff in your in your radar? Well, my father was in the financial business. He was somewhat entrepreneurial. He was also his side hustle was in media. So he had that, that kind of connection. Um and I just think that, you know, we came from a very Midwestern Protestant family that was uh, all about hard work. It was all about staying up to date. You know, what's happening? How do you get ahead? Uh, but it was all about how do you get ahead? And so my, my parents raised me that we're not going to give you anything. I know when I first wanted to get into business in my teens, I said, like, hey, dad, I got this great idea. Can, can you can you lend me like a thousand bucks? He's like, I'm not going to lend you anything. I'm not going to give you anything. You've got to figure it out. And so. You know, when I became uh, 19 or 20 and I really started my first business that took off, I was cold calling people, uh, you know, in the business to business space to, to bring in money uh, to to build the business from scratch. So that was the attitude. And I think he was in keeping up with his own personal interests in, in finance and just where's the world going, a voracious reader of the fourth turning and all kinds of books about, you know, no society lasts forever. Um, my grandmother. Uh, you know, taught ta us about her immigrant, uh, you know, ancestors. Her husband escaped from Czechoslovakia back after the war mm -hmm. and could never go back. He talked to us about that. And so there's this whole idea growing up that, oh, you know, well, now the Czech Republic is is something. It's not what it once was and that things change. And yet in the U.S., as you said, people are very much focused on what happens in the U.S., and uh, how many generations removed is it before the family business fails because nobody realizes what made it work in the first place? And how many generations is it before the, the country fails? And I think you're seeing a culture that is nothing like what made the U.S. successful. And as a result, you've seen a slow but steady rank, uh, drop in the rankings of economic freedom, personal freedom, all of that since I was first talking about this in 1997. Wow. OK, that's really interesting because. I'm so intrigued where people's perspective on these things come from. So, you know, I was born in the UK, grew up in Saudi Arabia, family night from Nigeria, traveled all around the world, spent a lot of time in the US, went to an American school when I was in Saudi. So for me, while I feel a personal connection to certain places, I myself don't really have this um, geographical allegiance that I noticed that I think most people have. I think actually that's kind of the that's kind of the norm. If someone is born in the UK and certainly raised there, they tend to feel like, okay, this is home. This is where I need to stay. Uh, people feel the same wherever they are from. And then there's a minority of people who have more of your type of philosophy, go where you're treated best. Uh, you know, they don't feel like, okay, this is where I'm from, but it doesn't mean I need to doesn't mean I need to stay here. I don't need to live here, work here and die here and raise my future children here and so on. 
So I'm curious when people have this more kind of global perspective where it comes from. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the how you got into the world of entrepreneurship? Well, I'll add to what you just said. I mean, I, yeah. you know, when you grow up in a city where for my entire life, I don't follow sports, but I guess for pretty much my entire life, you have the Cleveland Browns, the football team. I mean, a couple of years ago, they won zero, zero, <laughs> zero wins. I think the next year they won one. I mean, you know, I, by the way, I look back at people who still live there um, and it's like, oh, we're going to the Browns game. It's like the Browns have been losing for my entire life. <laughs> and you guys, it's like it's like Charlie Brown kicking the football that Lucy's holding. I mean, they just they can't realize like this isn't going to work out and they don't want to go. It's almost part of the identity. When I say to people, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, that the response is, I'm sorry to hear that um, people don't you know, they just want to stay and simmer in the same system and not improve. Right. And so I said, is this the place that I want to be? I mean, for many people, the weather sucks in Cleveland. So people want to get out for that. But, uh, you know, my, my entrepreneurial background, I guess, started there because I, I grew up around, you know, entrepreneurial parents. Again, they didn't want to give me finances, but they gave me these great lessons in how to be successful. And I never really wanted to go to school. I, I kind of half made it through high school. Uh, I didn't really want to go to university, but I felt like, well, that's what a smart person would do. So I went for a year, mm -hmm. um, spent most of my time staying up till four in the morning, thinking of business stuff and eventually left and, and started a business, started a couple different things. And, and it kind of eventually it took off in, um, in the broadcasting space. But I was always interested in entrepreneurship. I think one thing that's a lost art these days is I was selling, you know, candies and stuff door to door at eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 12, I was riding my bike up and down the street, um, selling people whose house was for sale, uh, websites. Hey, let me make you a website. There was really no real estate websites back then. But I said, hey, I'll make you a website. You can put it on your sign in the front yard. People can look at pictures. They can... I mean, that wasn't a thing back then. Um, now it seems so, so, so silly. But, um, you know, I was always out there, you know, made a magazine, was selling that door to door. Probably didn't stick with enough stuff long enough. Probably didn't push the, the repeat button enough on things that worked. Um, but I was always selling stuff and that to me is a lost art. And so to go into entrepreneurship, that stuff didn't seem risky to me at 19 or 20 to say, I'm going to drop out of university. I'm going to sit in my apartment and just call people. And I, I know it'll all work out. That's really interesting. I think there's, I've noticed when I uh, talking to a lot of people, there are certain parallels with these things. And one of them for sure is this entrepreneurial thing kicking in at a young age. Um, I went to boarding school. And I was constantly, you know, I was living in Saudi Arabia, but going to school in the UK. So I used to buy like Timberland boots and, and watches and even certain types of candy and stuff that you couldn't get in the UK. And I sort of do this import, export, <laughs> import, yeah. export business running back and forth, like, you know, from oh, 12, 12 years old <laughs> or whatever I was doing. And I've noticed that with a lot of people who in their in their older years are business owners or entrepreneurs, typically they started pretty early doing some kind of some kind of schoolyard hustle or something like that. By the way, I mean, the other thing that for me was, I mean, the United States, there were a couple of years of school, uh, maybe from eight to 12, where I totally felt comfortable, had a whole bunch of friends, but we moved around the city a lot. Um, and that gave me a lesson, uh, probably gave me some of my antsiness, my desire to move around. You know, people think I live in you know, I have six different places around the world. It's not because you know I couldn't live in one of them. It's because I, I suppose I'm used to. I like moving around. I like a change of scenery. I like different cultures. But mm. um, you know, one of those places that we lived, I felt very comfortable. Most of the rest, I never really felt comfortable. I didn't feel like I fit in. When I got older, and I was more about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship wasn't cool back then. Now it's like everyone's an entrepreneur on Instagram. It's a hashtag. Back mm. then, it was like you're a weirdo. Mm. And even in my 20s, it's like you're a weirdo. So. I think that entrepreneurship to a certain extent comes from people wanting to prove something to themselves and to other people. I mean, I think that probably, you know, you show me a guy who's 13 years old and who's got women hanging all over him in, in the seventh grade, it's probably not going to be as good of an entrepreneur. I mean, it's going to be beaten out of him the same way that it's going to be beaten out of people who lived in communist societies. There's just not going to be a sort of need. I think entrepreneurship ultimately is the, is filling a need in the market and filling a need in yourself, which is why you see so many entrepreneurs, um, you know, organically in places like India, where there just aren't the jobs to support people. And mm -hmm. I think it's why you see so many entrepreneurs who maybe don't feel like they're from, from where they belong. I mean, think about it. You know, Cleveland, Ohio isn't very far from Canada. 
Um, if I would have been born much further north, I'd be Canadian. My entire life story would be different. My entire tax obligations would be different. My entire everything would be different. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that you know we're all born in the right place to me is silly. Entrepreneurship is just one offshoot of um, you know filling that void. Absolutely. When you say go where you're treated best, which is something you say all the time, can you go wow. in a little bit more detail and depth of what you mean by that? Well, I think it's open to what are the things that are important to you. So I'm an entrepreneur and I was at the top paying, when you added everything together, 43% in taxes. That has been the most marketable service that I can offer people because plenty of entrepreneurs, especially in this age where it is cool and you can start an online business or you can be in crypto or you can do whatever, lots of people all over the world are making money and they're paying these ridiculous tax rates. And we've seen in the last two years, the government's not really there for you. You got stuck somewhere, tough luck. In mm. Australia's case, we don't even want you to come back. Sorry you took a holiday. Stay in India. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, benefits of citizenship gone. So I saw that as a kind of a libertarian from a very young age as well, kind of fit with the entrepreneurial picture. You know, why, you know, it always seemed ridiculous to pay high tax rates. But then when I got into my early 20s and I was paying these ridiculous tax rates, I said, there's got to be a better way. I kind of dovetailed that with my desire to live somewhere else just for the social reasons, the adventure reasons. And I said, OK, well, do I have to lower my taxes? Or how does that work if I move out of the U.S. start to pay taxes? And I realized how this stuff works. But, you know, that's something that's a very good business position for us. But, you know, uh, the position of I want to live somewhere else because the lifestyle is better, the people are better. I mean, when I started traveling through Europe, suddenly, you know, whereas in the United States, women are like, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? That's stupid. Suddenly, like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then went mm -hmm. out to Asia, same kind of perspective. Maybe these are my people. So that is something that I think people should consider. Uh, lifestyle, again, weather, it's anything of what is best to you, what is at the forefront. And so I'm an entrepreneur, I think like an entrepreneur, you know, I want to reduce expenses as much as possible to be competitive. That's tax. But I think as we enter a very difficult era in the West, and some of the stuff I was talking about with my family in the late 90s and early 2000s comes true, you need a second passport because Justin Trudeau may take your passport. Boris Johnson wants to take your passport. Australia may not let you into your own country. You need options, not only from the lifestyle place, if I like to live in Belgrade, Serbia part of the year, but hey, if you could be a citizen of a country that would give you extra travel privileges, a different identity, heck, look at what's happening in Russia right now. Those mm -hmm. people are going to be admitted nowhere. If you're only a Russian citizen, I hope you uh, enjoy living nowhere else because uh, the UK wants to kick them out. Um, the EU wants to cancel their visas. The U.S. hasn't been issuing them visas for some time. That identity affects you. And so I think it could mean a whole host of things, but we primarily talk about taxes, freedom, and investment. Mm -hmm. Do you think people in general are just too complacent? Because that's something that, yeah. that, that that's something I, I really sense. And two things I really think have gotten people into a lot of mess, particularly over the past two years in terms of lack of vigilance are this can't happen here mentality. And That's number one. It, yep, and it won't go that far mentality. And I think this is a pattern now and throughout history where people just get very comfortable and complacent and just think, oh, maybe they can kind of see things going weird or going sideways and they're getting uncomfortable, but they're just like, nah, this, this can't happen here. And I think in the past two years, that's really been exposed with a lot of Western countries. Absolutely it has. I mean, it's like that that show that I watch whenever I'm on the plane. I'm on a long flight, I'm taking a flight next week. I'm sure I'll see two broke girls again, right? What is it? I guess it's a woman whose father got in trouble for something and the whole family went broke. And she can't cope with the fact that, what do you mean there's no money? Well, sure, but just just send over the uh, send over the helicopter to take me somewhere. No, there's no more money. Mm. And it's it, if you're living in the Western world, we've been so accustomed to this your entire life. Um, I mean- when I started talking about this stuff 10 years ago, people thought I was crazy. Imagine like when my parents were saying, hey, we should move to Chile. Hey, we should move to New Zealand. <laughs> 1997. I mean, they were, I remember my father going on Prodigy. Remember Prodigy back in like 1994? Like saying, has anyone thought of moving to New Zealand? It seems like that may be the place to go. And people were like, you know, making fun of him. Like, well, you're a lunatic. Um, and yet now, you know, Peter Thiel and billionaires like that are going to New Zealand. It's the hot place to be. Um, and so... Yeah, people here in Eastern Europe where I'm at, I think they understand what's happened. They mm -hmm. understand uh, 
uh, here's how your currency gets devalued. They understand. Here's what happens when the government gets too powerful. Canadians are now seeing it. I mean, everyone in the Western world is seeing it. But I do think that people rationalize to themselves when it's in their country. It's temporary. They move the goalposts to where if this would have happened five years ago, now we're here. But, ah, you know, it's the it's the it's the frog in the boiling pot and they get comfortable mm. with it and they just figure, hey, there's always somewhere else better. And by the way, I mean, the media does such a great job of of propagandizing that um, to you. Listen, I gave up U.S. citizenship. I had family who turned on the television one morning about a year ago. They said, you're on this this crazy like conspiracy TV channel in Russia. They're showing <laughs> video and what does it say they're talking in russian in the background they're saying oh americans are all leaving their country and it shows like people burning their passports in protest like there's no freedom anymore and where are they all moving they're all moving to russia because russia is so great i never said that but like, i'm the guy who so you know <laughs> uh no hey listen i mean you know moscow is maybe not the worst place to live but uh it's a place people maybe should should look at it any other on any other day but um uh, I think that, um, you know, everyone has their own propaganda in the U S they do that. And in Russia, they do it and everywhere they do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When I watch your channel, sometimes it feels like you're, and obviously you, I mean, you talked about renouncing your U S uh, passport, which is a, which is a big deal in itself. What is it that concerns you so much about the trajectory of the USA? Because I think every country has this, but to me, the U.S. is really interesting because in some ways I feel and see so much optimism, but then there on a flip side, I feel really pessimistic. Maybe, maybe I feel about this about, about the West in general. Like there are certain things, if I look at certain markers and things, it's like, well, yeah, things, there's wobbles, but generally things are, things are improving. Things are getting better. Things are way, way, way better than they used to be. But then I'm also seeing certain things going on in the society and in the culture and even the way things are kind of leaning politically in terms of increased authoritarianism. And I'm like, man, maybe 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 the maybe the best days of this have already passed by and it's it's kind of tricky. So what's your what's your perspective on that? I think what you just mentioned is a big part of the problem. Um Every place has good things. I think mm -hmm. I've realized that somewhat about the U.S. Uh, the more that I've been gone, there are certainly good things. Um, you know, we hire people and I think a much more friendly environment, much more affordable environment. You know, but uh, hey, seven or eight percent payroll taxes in the U.S. I'm pretty nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, the overall cost where I'm at is still lower, but, um, you know, that's that's good. People move from countries like Canada and other Western countries because they cut down the tall trees there in Canada. That's what they say. Right. If you want to be too successful, they pull you down. I've got a friend from Norway. He says being rich is like, you're the devil. Yep. So, yep. I mean, that's becoming that way in the U S by the way. Um, but you know, to me, the problem is everyone thinks it's number one. That's the first problem. It's not number one and freedom of speech. It's like number 75 freest economy, 25 healthcare. It's in the forties. We put up the nomad passport next every year, barely in the top 40. Hey, out of 200, that's not terrible, mm -hmm. but I don't want to go where I'm treated a little bit better. I want to mm -hmm. go where I'm treated best. And I think that soft freedom outside of the United States is strong. Um, you know, the police presence in the U.S. Is, is, is an issue. I mean, you file your taxes. I remember, you know, I'm always in fear. I'm doing something wrong on that because um, I wanted to be compliant. I mean, it just there's a there's a certain culture of fear, I think, in the West. It's getting worse. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, I'm going to freeze your bank account because they don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson doesn't want to give you a passport if you've ever been to jail. I'm not advocating people go to jail, but I'm, you know, I thought the point was when you got out of jail, it's back to normal. You did your time. They're, they're trying to make these second class citizens across so many categories. And quite frankly, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an investor, if you're successful, they like you up to a certain point. You know, if you have a cupcake, you know, store with two employees, maybe they like you. When you start making millions of dollars, now you're the devil. You're not paying enough, even though you pay far more than everybody else. Mm. And I just get the safe place to be. Um, and I think people don't realize that, which is concerning. It's, it's one thing to have an objective understanding of the pros and cons. I don't think anyone in the U S has an understanding of any of the cons or anything else that's out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, there's so many, there's so many interesting ways to, to go on that. And this is where it's interesting because perspective comes in so much because being, being from the UK, one thing I love about the USA is that I think that success is celebrated much more here than it, it is. In, yeah, much more than the UK. 
Um, I've heard of, you know, Scandinavian countries with the kind of concept of Yante law that, you know, there's even more, you know, skepticism around people sort of flying too high and stuff like that. But one thing I actually love about the USA is I do feel like, hey, people here, whether you're an, a musician or you're an athlete or you're an entrepreneur, business owner, whatever, actually, it's, it's celebrated a lot more than it is in the UK. Um, that may differ from country to country, but as, as an as someone who's born in England, you know, worked there and done stuff a lot there, I find in the US actually, yeah, of course there are, of course there are haters and there are the, uh, you know, eat the rich people, <laughs> but I think that exists everywhere. Um, it's but it's an increasingly large uh, contingent. You have mm, to admit. Yeah, yeah. I, I think overall, overall though, and again, you know, this is, I, I think this, this is the, the reality, right? Is there's always going to be a little bit of grass is greener mentality. So I think, you know, I know, I know Americans who are like, they go to the UK and they're like, well, you know, they, this is so much better. Or I know British people yeah. go to the US and I, I know people move, moving in both directions right now. Um, I know Americans and Brits going to Mexico and people in Mexico going to the UK. This is, this is always the thing. For example, I mean, Eastern Europe, I love Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. I think it's actually a very underrated part of the world. I assume you you feel the same. I know you spend a lot of time there. You hire a lot there. If I tell people about places like Serbia or yep. Romania or you know Central Europe, you know Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovakia like people are like what? Like people kind of imagine they're, they're just these bombed out communist, uh, you know, very backwards places or something. Um, but then again again being somewhere from like from the uk i mean there's so many people there from poland and from romania and they're so much happier in the uk meanwhile you've got people in the uk who are like you know what? actually i want to go live in poland i want to go live in hungary <laughs> i want to go live in romania so it's a it's a little bit of a, a complicated and tricky one but i think that as you alluded to what's really important is to to have that perspective not to assume that some place is number one in everything just because you've been told that or you 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 live there and you have this kind of patriotism that's just kind of been embedded with you, but you haven't traveled elsewhere and seen other perspectives. So, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, listen, if if I had been to a hundred countries as I have, and 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 then said, hey, listen, the U.S. is absolutely the best. I feel the best. My I'm treated the best. My tax rates are the lowest. You know, whatever is important to me. By the way, people can criticize the tax rate thing. I mean, when you've got businesses you know, that generate millions, tens of millions of dollars a year. If you're in that camp or if you have huge gains on your crypto, your stock portfolio, whatever, you know, it makes a difference. Obviously, you know, if your tax bill is $5,000, that's not going to be as big of an objective. Um, so, you know, I think people should, should, should explore. I think that, you know, you have optionality when it comes to this. But I think, listen, I mean, people say, oh, the U.S. is a not, not a corrupt country. The statistics no longer bear that out. It, it's a highly institutionalized corruption country. Um, you need a billion dollars to be elected president, by and large. And so mm -hmm. that sounds pretty corrupt to me. Um, I mean, drug prices are through the roof. But OK, I live in countries a decent part of the year that have higher corruption rankings. And so my, my point to to that and to the point of um, we all want different things is, hey, I, I live kind of above a, in some of these countries because I'm not from there. So when mm -hmm. I go to Malaysia, for example, yeah, it's a place where people can't imagine why you don't have a car because they live a suburban lifestyle. But, you know, unlike in the U.S. where I'm from the culture, I don't feel badly that I choose not to have a car. I live in the middle of the city. I walk uh, where I want to go. I Uber. I hire a car service. Um, and so I don't have that kind of societal obligation on me. Therefore, I can kind of float above the culture. And by doing that, um, I, I avoid a lot of the nonsense that we would pick up in your own culture. I avoid the political stuff that doesn't come down. And I avoid things like, you know, the corruption. What is mm -hmm. the what is the price of, of Malaysia, for example? If, if people want to say that's a corrupt country, how does that affect me? I don't mm -hmm. have the bulk of my assets there. I think it's the difference between what my father talked about 25 years ago and what it is now. Now, what we talk about at Nomad Capitalist is, yeah, your money's in Singapore. Your investments are in Cambodia. You live in Malaysia on an investor visa and your citizenship is somewhere else because Malaysia won't give you citizenship, but they don't care where you're from. You know, the banks in Singapore are better. The returns in Cambodia are higher. So therefore, what are the downsides of a country like Malaysia impact me? Now, you could certainly say, hey, I'm going to do that to the United States. I'm going to live in the U.S. I'm going to bank in Singapore. I'm going to have a backup passport. I'm going to do whatever else. And I think that's a good first step. If you want to stay in the U.S., have mm -hmm. that backup plan, have redundancies. Um, but, you know, from a lifestyle perspective, I think there are a lot better places. 
I hear that. There's a term you used earlier, which um, I'm interested to go into a little. You said soft freedom. What do you mean by that? Well, hard freedom will be people say in the U.S., oh, we have the Constitution. We've got the Bill of Rights. You know, we have an advantage. Well, that's great. I mean, how many times does the U.S. government violate the Constitution on an ongoing basis? I mean, whether it's whatever it's Snowden talks about. It. I mean, just, just 20 years of examples ever since 9-11. I mean, they violate it on an ongoing basis. And so when the people who make the rules also get to enforce the rules and you don't get a say and you don't even know what they're doing sometimes, that's great. You've got a Constitution. That's cute. Um, you know, if you can't assemble to protest something. If you can't post certain things online, I mean, look at people who are coming to the doors in Australia and Canada. You post something on mm -hmm. social media, they're coming to your door. The police are coming to your door. What is happens, this? It happens in the UK as well. Yeah, the, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's great. You got freedom of speech. Do you really? Uh, mm -hmm. That's great that you have to, you know, I mean, so I'm not saying there's nothing, but I'm also saying that, you know what? Things are a lot more laissez faire in parts of the world. Um, you know, I've seen people who, again, let's use Malaysia. You know, they, they have a they, they have a run in with the police, for example. The police aren't looking to slam everyone to the ground and throw one in the back of the car. They don't have the guns drawn. It's some guys who just came from the Nazi lemmick stand. And, you know, they're just trying to resolve problems. And, OK, what's your side? OK, you know, I mean, it's like. To me, Do that's you, a soft freedom. Is, is that the case for is that the case for locals as well? Because I know, of course, there are places where the experience as an expat or as a foreigner versus being a local is very different. Again, you know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Where I grew up, it was primarily an expat community, lots of Americans, Canadians, Brits, and so on. There are certain liberties and freedoms and tolerances that you'd have in that within that community that I'm very aware of. You know, if you are a native-born uh, Saudi citizen, whether you're a man or a woman, you're going to have a pretty different experience. Same with places like, um, you know, places like, the UAE, depending on where yeah. you're coming from, even if you're, you know, an, an American versus a, um, you know, an Indian, so on and so forth, you may have a very different experience. So there's three things there. Yeah, the okay. first part is the unfortunate kind of racial issues where, yeah, if you're an Arab American going to Israel, they're going to give you a hard time. They don't care mm -hmm. about your passport. And that's why Israelis, despite being alleged, you know, best friends with the US, they cannot go to the US without a visa because mm -hmm. of the, the mistreatment of, of the U.S.'s mind, the Arab Americans. If I go to somewhere in the Middle East, yeah, you're right. I've seen this. I'm behind a guy from Pakistan. I'm on a passport that a lot of people in the Western world we, we consider eh, it's kind of average. That's not so great. I come up. Oh, hey, man, how's the weather? Right. Yeah. I'm getting ready to be accosted. So sure, there's some of that. I will say on the local front, you know, we do a lot of citizenship work, residence work for our, our clients. Uh, we often need police records, and we'll we'll do due diligence on people. You know. And we have more people from the U.S. who it's like, oh, I, 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 I urinated on a bush when I was 19 outside of a bar or something. And they came and they put me in jail for a week and I got charged with felony, this or that. And then they played it down. And they're like, yeah, in Serbia, if you pee in a bush, the guy's just like, what the hell? Just keep it moving. Right. Mm -hmm. Or nobody even says anything. So, I mean, I do think in the, for many cases, that's the case. I would also say, listen, not that I necessarily support this, but go to a country like a Mexico you know, you go to the DUI checkpoint, you know, they're looking for cash, yeah. right? So that's pretty universal. And I have a friend who got stopped twice at the at the checkpoint. He's like, oh, I just talked to your colleague back there. He's like, oh, you already paid. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I, I often tell people that, um, you know, there's corruption everywhere. What changes is the level of sophistication. So if you go and to the, more and the beneficiaries, I, listen, I, I, oh, yeah, I certainly, yeah. I certainly hope, uh, in all serious, as I get older and married and, you know, looking to the future, I mean, I certainly would hope that, uh, people aren't, aren't out there, you know, drinking and driving. Um, but you know, uh, obviously, you know, I don't want people to get somebody get hurt from that, but the idea that you're, you're urinating on a bush or something, and then your life is going to be over, mm -hmm. uh, that's a little, maybe a little much. Yeah, Absolutely. You you just brought up something uh, interesting there. So a comment I get often because you know I I'm I pretty openly, especially on Twitter, talk about people moving or you know just just traveling, going to different places, and especially over again over the course of the past two years, even with I have a lot of followers in Australia, in Canada, in certain countries where things have just been turned totally upside down, and I've kind of been 
ringing an alarm since 2020 saying, hey, like it's looking like your country's about to go pretty crazy. You know, you should at least be looking at moving. And, you know, I, I've I relocate around a lot. And of course, something that comes and something I recognize is like, hey, well, you are you're an entrepreneur and you are single. You don't have a family. You don't have kids. So easy for you to say. So in terms of practical advice for people who do have a traditional job and or a family, what are your, what, what, what's the, what's the starting point for somebody like that? Say you've got someone who's in the U S or in the UK, maybe another Western country, and they like the sound of, you know, moving to Mexico or Malaysia or whatever, but they're like, Hey, I've got, I've got three kids. Um, I've been doing what I do for a while. I can't just up and leave. I've got a mortgage. I've got this, I've got that. What's the starting point for somebody like that? The fact that you've got a mortgage, I mean, housing prices in the Western world are at insane levels. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you could sell your house in the U S you could probably buy three houses in on the beach in Mexico in some parts. I mean, I don't, to me, I wouldn't want I, I would want to diversify some of that wealth at these insane price valuations driven by inflation and some of the other things. I, I would want to diversify that. So the mortgage to me, I mean, if you live in many parts of the U.S., you can sell your house tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not an issue. You know, why is it the people who work for, um, you know, the diplomatic corps, for example, they're they're capable of moving. They take their kids. I mean, some of the guys, I mean, Kevin O'Leary, for example, he says, I uh his stepfather worked for, I think, the United Nations. Every two years, they move somewhere different. Cambodia, mm. Ghana, I mean, all over the world. Nobody questions that. Mm. Um, listen, my, my father made the decision uh, that, hey, we've got kids, uh, two at the time and later four, and uh, I don't want to, to move. And I guess at the time, I thought, hey, yeah, you know, I, there's this girl I like in sixth grade. Like, uh, hey, that's, uh, that sounds like a good plan to me. Let's stay put. <laughs> Looking back on it, I mean, when my life had been so damaged, I think people do this thing where, like, their kids – are so fragile. I, mean, I think the kids are going to need to be need to be global. I mean, the the U.S. Uh, is going to be a less and less relevant economy. You want your kids to understand. Jim Rogers, we spoke to. You know, his his kids speak flawless Chinese. Mm. You know, fluent you know, or, uh, Arabic. I mean, whatever it is, giving them the skills is important. So, I mean, we do see where husband and wives or girlfriends and boyfriends aren't always on the same page. So it's important in our process to help get them on the same page and make some kind of compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly if you're single, I can tell you this. I mean, being married to someone who is uh, from Moscow and much more eager to move than probably someone from Phoenix, Arizona, where I, I spent my early adult years. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, finding a partner who, who likes it and says, hey, I, I'd like to go somewhere else. Um, it's probably something to look for. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the next question I get from a lot of people is... Where's Ubi? Everywhere is the same. Everywhere is the same. Like oh, this, no. this, this is how. Yeah, I know. I know it's all. But well, like, people have this notion that, oh well, I just leave here and then I go somewhere else and I just encounter all the same problems. I have the same encroachments on my liberty. All the same issues. The government's going crazy, so on and so forth. A lot of people have been led to believe that no matter where you go. It's the same they don't want situation to do it. or worse. Yeah, it's, it's easy. It's defeatist. It's mm. easy to be a defeatist. It just makes your life easy. I don't have to do anything now. Right. I mean, yeah. no matter how hard I work, I won't get ahead. OK, well, that's great. By the way, I'm happy for you to think that way. But then don't ask me to pay 50 percent. You know, I'm not paying 10 million dollars in taxes every year and you pay 2000 and then you say I don't pay enough. N no, thanks. So if you want to mm. be a defeatist in any part of your life, I'm welcome for you to do that. Listen, I need people to. Uh, you know, I, I need shoes shined. I need a house cleaned. I mean, I need people who've given up on life. Uh, but I would like to think that we can help uplift people more than that. Uh, but you can't. And so, I mean, let's identify what the issues are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly quantifiable things. Um, you know, I want to lower my taxes because I'm not I'm paying too much. I can't reinvest in my business enough. By the way, big issue now because you have people starting businesses all over the world. We've helped people from Morocco, from Egypt, from South Africa, from Colombia, from Brazil, from Thailand, who have become multimillionaire entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. You think it's the school system in the U.S. that helped them? No, they did it. They learned how to do it because they didn't have excuses. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm so proud of that. I mean, people from Moldova, I mean, how do they do it? And you can't in the U.S., in the U.K., you've got an excuse. You deserve to be shining people's shoes. I'm sorry. Enough with the excuses. <laughs> the environment. No, it's for real. Yeah. And so, I mean, 
Um, if we have a quantifiable, quantifiable index, like I want to lower my taxes, well, you can go somewhere else and do that for sure. Even mm -hmm. if you're an American with worldwide taxation on your passport, you can do that. Otherwise, let's define what your issue is. I don't care if it's COVID. I don't care if it's, I mean, name something else. You tell me what you want. I'll find you a place that's better. Oh, where's the healthcare going to be better? Mm -hmm. You know, we won an award. I promoted uh, Malaysian healthcare because I go there. It's affordable. It's great care. Um, and we got recognized for that. I think it's better care than in the U.S. So you give me a factor, Zuby, and I'll tell you where I think it's better. But let's define for these people what the factors are, and there will be somewhere better. Here's why you think that nowhere is better, because you're stuck in the bubble of I'm in the U.S. So, like, if Trump wins, I'm moving to Canada. That kind of logic, right? Mm -hmm. if your bubble now is Canada. Oh, well, they're even worse. OK, well, maybe I'll go to the U.K. Yeah, they're not much better either. But as you said, who's heard of Serbia? We have people yes. from our team, they, they, Serbia, they go somewhere. Oh, you're from Siberia? You're from Syria? <laughs> like, like nobody even knows. I mean, you know, mm. the heart of, you know, ex Yugoslavia. And so um, if you start looking at places, and by the way, I mean, we just had a guy who is a, a multi-deca millionaire. He is really concerned about what's happening in the Western world. He was living in the Cayman Islands. And he said, I don't like what's being what's being pushed on me here. Mm. For him, being in that part of the world in that time zone, the best place for him was Nicaragua. He's getting a beautiful home on the beach down by San Juan del Sur on the Costa Rican border. And uh, that's where he wants to go. But he's open-minded to the fact that Nicaragua, which is in the headlines for bad reasons in your lifetime, may be yes. the place where you can go and find more personal freedom. If Nicaragua is not in your bubble then your bubble's not big enough. I'm not endorsing Nicaragua, but I'm saying the bubble that you are talking about, there's nowhere to go, mm. isn't big enough because you're already excluding 90% of places. Yes. Yeah, I noticed that completely. Oftentimes when people talk about the world, they're talking about the Anglosphere. They're talking about the English-speaking yep. Western world. They're only considering five or six countries and anything outside of that doesn't even fall into their remit. I think part of that as well is because of language. Um, I think obviously, you know, most people from English speaking countries are only speak English and for various reasons are often unwilling to honestly make any effort, which is which is their bad to learn anything else. So people do see the options just as, you know, Australia, New Zealand, UK, Ireland, Canada, USA, and outside of that. You know, the entire continent of Africa is off limits to them. The entire continent of South America is off limits to them. Asia but is off limits lost. to them, maybe with uh, the exception of Dubai or something like that. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a tricky one. I, I, I experienced this with many, many things. It goes beyond this subject where you, you want to help people, but you can only help people who are not going to come up with excuses and invent obstacles and barriers, you know, mentally with everything. You know, I, I do, uh, I help people with, uh, with, with fitness stuff or, you know, I, I wrote a, I wrote a book about fitness and you can only help someone who want, who genuinely wants to get in shape. They, they genuinely want to train and they want to eat better and they do want to change their body because there's infinite excuses, right? Like we can, we can all come up for excuses to not go to the gym or not eat right, whatever. It's not hard to do. Um, but I think with this, people genuinely have to really, really want it because if you don't, the easiest thing to always do is just do what you've been doing. Just stay in place, keep complaining, shrug your shoulders, you know, whine about it. But it's only a minority of people who are like, you know what, I'm, I'm really not comfortable with the way things are going. I'm going to really look into this. I'm going to take action and In I'm anything, going to seek though, to. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, you know, I, so many of our clients are unique kind of contrarians in many ways they're on the keto diet you know they don't drink I mean, they do things that are different mm -hmm. uh for me it was always entrepreneurship i mean for me to for me to go to the gym i have to literally go to the i have to have the guy come to my house <laughs> I do. If he's not knocking at my door at 7 30 to where I, i'm too groggy to get away from him i'm not going i've tried and so i have to bring the guy to my house and i don't have it in every city and so that's the maybe the downside of nomadism because i haven't made enough of a commitment to that but mm. let's go through the let's go through the languages You've got Belize. Uh, you've got, you know, here in Serbia, I mean, one of the best English speaking countries. It's not native. 
You've got countries like the Netherlands where it's pretty good. You've got parts of Portugal. Um, you've got places like Malaysia and Singapore. I mean, those are just places that are pretty, pretty good. You can find enclaves that speak English almost everywhere. Um, so, I mean, I've, as I said, been over a hundred countries in the last however many number of years. Uh, I don't learn, you know, Khmer and Cambodia. I don't learn uh, Vietnamese. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I know some Serbian, but I'm not really fluent. I mean, I can maybe order some food or something, but I'm not going to put in the effort to become fluent because you know, for two or three months a year, it's not necessarily worth it. So, um, I mean, there's always a, a reason around it in the same way of me saying, I know I'm not going to go to a gym. So let me do this. Let me have the guy come to my house and he'll bring the <laughs> stuff with him. And at least I'll get something. Maybe I'm not, I'm not going to be at your level, but at least I'm going to be, I'm not going to be totally falling apart. So, yeah. I, and I think that, you know, from my perspective, um, so, by the way, so many places in South America that are great. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so many places in Asia that are great. My wife, who came from from Moscow, had so many preconceived notions, but wanted to travel. Smashed all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Certain notions of living in your country. She goes to, for example, Muslim country like Malaysia. This isn't what I expected. Goes to South America. Oh, my goodness, this is so vibrant and colorful. And I've kind of adjusted my outlook on life. Let's just enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, uh, has picked up on, hey, so many people are nicer than where I'm from, which has kind of helped me see that. So I, I you know, this is why in our business, uh, we charge people to help them. I'm not operating like all the companies in Dubai where we just <laughs> let people come in 17 times and discuss it because on a personal level, it frustrates me. It really does. Mm -hmm. Forget business. It frustrates me to hear all the excuses. Um, I think Western societies, you need at least a redundancy. You need at least a plan B. You need to be prepared because they can do anything. They can take your money. They can cancel your passport. They can stop you from leaving. They've shown that. Um, I want to have options at the very least. If you don't want to move, fine. Start that stuff. Tiptoe your way in. And once you realize the money you put in that little bank account overseas is still there, once you realize you can travel on this other passport as well, um, et cetera, et cetera, you will start to get more comfortable, I think. Mm -hmm. Take a vacation to Serbia. Don't go to Cancun again. Take a vacation somewhere. <laughs> Whatever it is that you yeah. want to do, go to Chicago, whatever. It's comfort zones, man. That That's always the thing with human beings. It's so hard to get people outside of their little comfort bubble. And it's only worth trying to some degree. Like I said, if someone doesn't yeah. want to do it, you know, it's like, hey, like it's, it's, it's your life. Um, I'm not going to try to, I, I encourage people to maximize their opportunities and maximize their potential. But hey, I also am not in the business of trying to force anybody to do this stuff. A uh, big question. I, you go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's freedom. And, and, but I think that the issue is, listen, if you want to be one of the 38 million people living in California, being, you know, subject to all these restrictions, you know, the taxes are going through the roof. I mean, mm -hmm. that's fine. I would like for you to know the alternatives, plenty of beaches, plenty of girls in bikinis, other places. Um, you can get all that stuff somewhere else. Plenty of good restaurants. Um, but if you really like it the best, that's fine. But don't tell me that somehow, oh, well, you're not as successful as, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos or something because he lives there. It's like, listen, we all choose what's best for us. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's not just lower taxes. It's a whole lifestyle. It's a whole approach on life. And, uh, you know, some people maybe have a business need. Elon Musk probably is not moving Texas, to, uh, not moving uh, Tesla to Serbia. Mm -hmm. But you know, maybe you should be looking at, I mean, these guys have, these guys have second passports. These guys have options. You should have some options. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, that's really interesting because I, I say this all the time to, to my American friends, because one thing that's great about the USA, which is really underrated is that sure it's one country, but you do have 50 options in terms of climate, even tax implications, very different uh, ways of living, different cultures, different types of people, demographics, so on and so forth. So I, I find it extremely puzzling when I, I see someone, you know, they're in California and they're, they've been whining about California for four or five years. And I'm like, dude, you can, you don't even need to leave your country. Like with me, like if the U, if the UK goes to crap, like you, 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 you got to leave the whole country, right? With most yeah, nations. Like yeah. With most nations, if, the place goes down. It's very top down. It's not, there's no federalism. It's just like, okay, well, if it gets bad in France, you know, you gotta, you gotta get out of France, but here it's like, well, you could even just go to Arizona. You could go to Texas, you could go to Florida, but people are not even willing to even, even within California, if you're in LA County and it's crazy, it's like, you could move to Huntington beach. You could go, you could go up North, you know, one hour, but people are so unwilling 
to do that, which I find I, it's something I find really interesting because I'm really not wired that way. I'm just like, look, look, like I'm peacing out, you know, <laughs> give me, give me, give me a couple of days notice. And I'm, <laughs> give yeah. me a couple of days, I'm like, okay, bye. You know, I'm, I'm gone. Um, but I understand for whatever reason, um, I'm the exception in that rather than that being, that being the rule. We have Adam Carolla coming and speaking at our, uh, Nomad Capitalist Live Oh, conference. awesome. Great guy. And, and the reason being that he, he has been a, I think a, a poignant person speaking out against California. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and convince him, Adam, like, why don't, why don't we get moving? You can do the podcast from anywhere. <laughs> but I happen to agree with you. Listen, I mean, you can move to Florida. You still have all the federal restrictions, federal regulations. Um, you still have all the federal taxes. So, I mean, you can save 13, 14%. Um, to me, you know, the, 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 the even bigger argument is if you're going to move, right, all the things we've mentioned that people don't move, I, I got I to gotta pack up the furniture of the truck. Right? I mean, Americans have a lot of stuff. Mm. So I got to pack up the truck. We got to have the moving guys come. The kids have to change schools. Well, if you're moving from Huntington Beach to Gilbert, Arizona, Okay, Arizona just raised their taxes. They have a tax, but it seems comfortable. It's close by. All right, why don't we go to Miami instead? Why don't we go to you know somewhere nice in Miami of a tour? Mm-hmm. And if you can go to Miami, what's so much worse about Puerto Rico? You know, there's enclaves where you can speak English and you can hang out with your you know Dorado, what have you. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to uh, to Puerto Rico, what's really that much difference in going to Panama? Because you know, in Europe, I mean, you as, a, as if you're a British citizen, you can go and live in Ireland. I think that's one of the best countries in the Western world, quite frankly. I don't like a lot of them, but Ireland and Switzerland would probably be some of the best for taxes. And, and they speak English in Ireland. You have that. Um, as a foreigner, you can get tax incentives. Um, but, you know, why not move somewhere else? Why not, you know, consider moving to a place like an Ireland, like a Panama, like a who knows where. If you're already moving, you might as well move. And, and so people move from France to Ireland. People move from the UK to Ireland, people move from France to Germany. I mean, they do that. Um, mm. and I just think that if you're going to go through the effort of, of moving, you might as well give it all it's got, you know, don't, don't lick around the edges. So interesting, man. I know, I know people in Ireland trying to get the heck out of that. <laughs> it, oh, it's, yeah. It, yeah it, it's, it's really interesting, man. And you know, and, and I think this is something that's important for people to know is of course there, there is no perfect place, right? There's no, everywhere has got it's pros and it's cons, advantages, disadvantages. That's just reality. And also we all have different, we all rank things differently in terms of what's important to us, right? For some people, lowering tax is very important. For some people, it doesn't matter at all. You know, they care about the, the what's the society and the culture and what language is spoken. Some people, it's it's climate. You know, there's some places I'm just, I just wouldn't live in a lot of places, period, because I hate the weather. Like if I'm somewhere where the weather is bad, no matter the other stuff, I'm not, I'm not going to be happy. And I think that's something that actually keeps people in places like LA because the weather is so good that despite all the nonsense, they're like, uh, well, I could go somewhere else, but you know, it's sunny all the time. A big question I have for you, Andrew, and, um, I don't know how you want to answer this one is, but you've been speaking a lot about foresight. So some of the ideas that you are implementing now and some of the things that you see going on in the world now are things you said in your family you've been discussing since the 90s and through the thousands and so on where do you see where do you see the world going where do you see things being we're in 2022 right now in 2042 where do you see the world being where do, where do you see the USA where do you see the west where do you see some of these more developing countries how do you think that's generally going to change well i think that you have what i call the western countries are largely legacy brands part of the reason why i might like an island more is because again they have a fair tax system i think for foreigners and because it's perhaps not as many, on as many people radar mm-hmm. i mean people you know what adam carolla says is you know california is the hot the hot blonde cheerleader in high school and uh you know that doesn't last forever if you just milk only that one attribute mm-hmm. right and so I mean, if you're the U.S., you've been milking that attribute and you've been basically telling people what Gavin Newsom is telling people in California, where else are you going to go? Mm-hmm. You know, this is the place to be. Watch these mm-hmm. Border Patrol shows. They literally show these guys, you know, determining who gets into the country and who doesn't. Oh, they'll be back. This is the best place to be. Like mm-hmm. They really believe it. Uh, and so you have people in emerging countries who want to come and take advantage of that. Some because they believe in the in the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, some because it's just, you know, I mean, every Mexican I've talked to as a client, they want to move to Canada. That's the okay. place to be right now, right? Every country has their place to go, but it's the in place to go. Mm. And so there's a certain kind of 
um, follow the herd mentality of that. There's a certain kind of legacy branding. Um, that stuff doesn't go away quickly. And I think for maybe for some people, there's also the interest in, hey, I can get some some cash here, right? I mean, obviously some people, are, not a lot of people, but maybe some people are looking for kind of the welfare state, stronger welfare state. Mm. Um, so you're going to see a more diverse population in Western countries. I'm, I'm very much for immigration. I think that, you know, talent and, and investment-based immigration is the strongest that you can find. I think Western countries have generally disagreed with me. They hate the UK just canceled their investor visa, bring two million pounds into our country, invest it, keep it locked up, and you can live here and you have the privilege of paying us taxes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't like um, that. They can't. Oh, they scrapped it? They, it's canceled. It's gone. Mm. Um, all over the Russia thing. That's their argument. Mm. Well, are you going to let people come in under other terms with no money? I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be rather have people with, with money than no money? And so I think that you're going to see more diversity in those countries, which I'm very much a fan of. But you're going to lose some things along the process, particularly because they may bring in some of the wrong people. And so you're going to see at the same time the Chinese and Indian economies um, take off. Um, you're going to see Africa take off. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly think that, I mean, look at the, my portfolio in the last year. India has been the top performer. Um, mm. Indonesia is a top performer. That's a market no one's talking about. You've got one of the largest populations in the world. It's barely on many people's radar. Um, so you're going to see countries like that take off. You're going to see more people that are moving to tax-friendly places. I mean, look at real estate in Puerto Rico. Look at real estate in Dubai. Just in the last two years, people are afraid of, of rising taxes. They're going to seek that out. Um, I think that the West is not going to become irrelevant. It's going to be propped up by by, by largely immigration in the UK, people aren't reproducing. It's mm -hmm. a trend in Western Europe, less so in the US. Um, so you're going to have to have immigration. Um, you're going to see more and more debt. They're going to get more and more desperate. They're going to take away more and more freedoms. They're going to take more of your money. Remember, Bernie Sanders loves the days back when Eisenhower was president in the US and top tax rate was 91%. So you're going to see more of that confiscatory policy that's going to drive out successful people. And you're going to see countries like the US become like New York in the 1970s, where it's just kind of a a whole mm -hmm. um, and there's that kind of relevant that legacy relevance but someone's going to come in and turn it around when they hit rock bottom so i think that south america despite some of the 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 um uh the volatility will be a place to be for freedom uh, i see opportunities there uh eastern europe will be a place for freedom you'll see select pockets of western europe that are strong and i think you'll see asia be very interesting mm -hmm. um so uh, it's gonna be very interesting to watch but uh, I, don't, I don't think that like, the dollar is not going to zero. I mean, it basically has gone to zero in the last 100 years. But, I, mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think it's the Weimar Republic, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. But um, I, I, it'll be less relevant for sure. Mm. It, it's all, really all, all that to me is irrelevant in the sense of like, do, by the way, in the current environment that we're in geopolitically, I, I'd rather be a St. Lucian than an American citizen. Um, I'd rather be St. Lucian than a Russian citizen mm -hmm. uh, or at least have that on top of it. You know, I want to be under the fray. And so I don't necessarily know that I care what happens in the U.S. If I can find opportunities there um, that are that are efficient for me, I'll do that. But why why do I need to be attached to that as part of my identity that I'm a winner? Right. Mm -hmm. Why can't I be a winner and say if St. Lucia is my my flag of convenience, so be it and I'll live where I want. So many interesting thoughts there, man. I mean, something something strange that's been going on, I think is, and I think this will continue, is that in multiple levels, there's this inversion that's, that's happening. And I think that places that, I think one advantage of places which have been through some crap more recently, as in in the last few decades, so I'm thinking you know, former Soviet Union, certain parts of South America, certain parts of the Middle East and Africa, where this is a lot fresher in some people's minds, like how crazy things can get, how bad things can get. I mean, people who grew up under communism, for example, whether they are, uh, you know, whether they're um, from Romania or they're from Russia or they're from certain parts of Asia, they seem to in my observation, maybe I have a bias sample, but they seem to be the true liberty lovers and the, and the liberty advocates, whereas people who have always grown up in so-called democratic and liberal countries, they sort of take it all, they take it for granted. They don't even see when their freedoms and rights are being infringed upon or are being you snatched up. And Yeah. It's really odd. So it, it, cause it, it's so fascinating. I mean, 
to to hear an American and to know people from America, Canada, UK moving to places like Romania, Serbia, Mexico, for in Dubai, <laughs> for for increased freedom and liberty. I mean, I, I feel like Western, I mean, Western leaders, if, if, if they had if they had sense and they really cared about these things, I mean, they should be looking at that pattern and going, hmm, perhaps we've uh, have we been have we been out America, right? You know, the USA is the you know, land of the free, home of the brave, right? Everything is based around that concept of liberty. If someone were to ask the average person anywhere in the world, what is the most free country in the world? What's the country that values liberty the most? I think a good chunk of people would say the United States of America, because that is entirely what it's supposed to be about. But I think, unfortunately, the the differentiation between the, the, the branding and the marketing and even, you know, some aspects of the history versus what is happening in reality right now, that that soft free, that soft freedom that you talk about, it's, um, you know, I, I talk to people in some places, they're like, hey, you know, I, I didn't I, I didn't get this shot, so I can't. I can't go to a restaurant. I can't go to the gym. I can't uh, do this. I can't do that. And I'm like, dude, like, and and you're supposed to be in some free place. And then I'm like, dude, you could you you'd have more freedom almost anywhere else. Yeah, on paper, yeah. Me, on well, paper, exactly. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, but, it's interesting. I think it's number, the United States is number one on that on that barometer because no one's heard of Finland, right? Mm -hmm. Or or. You know, I mean, nobody's thinking of small countries. So that, I mean, the best thing that the United States did was they had, you know, it's it's manifest destiny. It's coast to coast. Um, so it's it's a big place. It's on the radar. Um, I mean, okay, nobody knows where Russia is. You could go to Southeast Asia and say you're from Russia, and good luck because they, they don't know <laughs> what, what you're talking about. But so that's what do, I guess. But um, um, I mean, it's a it's branding. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, the Heritage Foundation Economic of Econ uh, of Index, uh, Index of Economic Freedom. This is one of the things we would talk about around the dinner table. And it was like, I think back in the, in the late 90s, the U.S. was like number five. Mm -hmm. Singapore, and it's like, oh, yeah, that Singapore was pretty cool. And back then, you could actually still move to Singapore because they still needed people. Now, it's too late. You know, we're, we're already better. Um, now, the U.S. is 25th. And above it are four co uh, countries that were communist in your lifetime. Right below it, it, it lost a little bit of ground this year, was Georgia. So mm -hmm. you got four or five countries that are basically tied with or beating the U.S. for economic freedom that were communist in your lifetime. Uh, most of them for you know, post-Soviet countries. The world changes. And when I go to Malaysia and I look back at um, you know 30 years ago, what Malaysia looked like, it looks nothing like it looks today. Mm. So the world has become competitive. And so to say, hey, I don't want to go anywhere else, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for opportunities to get an edge. And so if your competitors uh, are from Eastern Europe where they don't want to live where they're from potentially, uh, and they say, hey, we're going to go to Cyprus or we're going to go to Dubai and we're going to pay a very low rate of tax, you're now at a competitive disadvantage to them by staying in your country. Mm -hmm. And if you're hiring people that are expensive, you're at a competitive disadvantage. I mean, remote work is a big trend right now. Uh, and yet to me, what so many people in the West don't see about remote work is the double-edged sword that that's great. I can hire people anywhere. I can hire the most talented person. And no longer do I have to hire you just because we share the same nationality. No longer do you have a competitive advantage because you were born in the right country. I'm going to hire the best person. And when you see some of these people in these other countries, obviously like anywhere else, there's a lot of people who aren't very good. But there are some people who are really motivated more than you've ever seen. And mm. so this where it happens. And then politicians come in because, you know, wages don't grow enough. Politicians ruin the, the monetary system. You know, people like me don't want to hire in their countries to be at a disadvantage, cost more, more litigation, more risk, more red tape. And oh, by the way, if I'm overseas, I can't hire Americans without taking a tax hit. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. And then why aren't our wages going up? Well, because the world's more competitive. And so, you know, isn't that what we want in our life, Zuby? Is we want we want competition? Don't we want to have McDonald's and Burger King? I know you're a fitness guy, but you know, Burger King, <laughs> and Wendy's, and Hardee's, and you know, In and Out and Smash Burger. You know, I mean, isn't aren't we better for that as consumers to have all those options versus back in the day when it, you just go to McDonald's? Why is it that when there's so many more places to go where you can pick from the buffet of whatever it is that you want? or have multiple countries plant flags in multiple countries, take from each part of the buffet, why would we say, you know what, I want to go back to the place when there were two countries to choose from the world and everyone else was screwed? And oh, mm. by the way, what does it say about you as a person that everyone else, you know, Steve Bannon, 
uh, who worked for Trump, said we hollowed out our middle class in the U.S. to build one in Asia. As if Asians aren't entitled to their own middle class. They should just stay riding bicycles for the rest of their life so that we can be living in extreme privilege in 4,000 square foot tract houses. That world's over. You can adapt or not. But, you know, people who are doing what I'm doing are not going to stop. You can adapt or you can stay with the system and it'll work as long as it works. Boom. I think that's a very powerful statement to end on. Andrew, man, thank you so much for your time and your insight and all the content that you put out there. If people want to check you out and follow you online, where's the best place for them to go? So nomadcapitalist.com is the website. We work with seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors who want to be clients. I think the best place to start, if you're new to this, read the book, Nomad Capitalist on Amazon. It helps not only give you information, but it gives you a lot of the stories. It's not, it's not going to be your personal strategy in the book. Okay? I can't write a book for every person, but it's going to give you the vibe. The most successful people I've helped start with a book. We also have over 1,500 videos on YouTube. We put out one new every day. Search Nomad Capitalist. So Anywhere uh, YouTube and books and websites are sold, you will find Nomad Capitalist. And we've got a lot of free content out there to help you get into the vibe. Awesome. Everyone listening, highly recommend checking out the channel. Check out the book as well. Andrew Henderson from Nomad Capitalist. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Good to be with you.